Okay, um, so welcome to the TED Colloquium today. And uh, our speaker today is Oliver Penchenik. So Oliver um, obtained his PhD from University um, of Illinois at the Urbana-Champaign um, in 2016. And afterwards he worked as Hill Assistant Professor at the Rutgers University and also um, as Assistant Professor at the University of Michigan. And earlier this year, he joined our department um, Oliver works on um, algebraic combinatorics and um, symmetric functions. And today he's going to talk about partial orders on the symmetric group. Oliver. Great, thanks. Uh, thanks everyone for coming. So I'm going to talk about some poset structures on the symmetric group and, and their combinatorial properties. And so everything uh, is going to be joint work with Zach Hamaker and David Speyer and Anna Weigand. And uh, in my abstract, I said I would also talk about some stuff, uh, some more recent stuff minus Zach, uh, but I'm not going to have time to do that. So I'll just talk about uh, the stuff with everybody. So uh, oh, here we go. So let's talk about uh, post set. So I'll have a, a finite post set, a finite graded post set. So I have the sense of these ranks. I break up my post set into pieces according to how far things are from the bottom. And I can look at how big these ranks are. So here I have one thing, and here are three things, and here are three things, and here I have one thing. And well, we notice some nice properties here. So one nice property your post set might have is that the sequence 1, 3, 3, 1, it might be a palindrome. And then we say our post set is rank symmetric if the ith rank from the bottom and the ith rank from the top or you're always the same size. And there's another nice property that the sequence has, which is that it starts off as an increasing sequence, and then it turns around, and it turns into a decreasing sequence the rest of the way. And so when we have a post set like that, uh, we call it rank unimodal. And those are two nice things your post set might be like. And then also do this notion of a chain. So a chain is a set of elements of the post set, all of which are comparable to each other, something like that. And we also have an anti-chain, which is the opposite, things that none of which are comparable to each other. So something like this. Now, if I want to find an anti-chain, uh, in general, it's not so easy. But one thing I can always do to produce an anti-chain is if I just grab all the elements on a single rank, then clearly none of them are comparable to each other. So that's one way of producing an anti-chain. That's not everything. For example, I could also take this, and there's another anti-chain, but one sort of, uh, this kind of anti-chain is sort of hard to uh, produce without knowing something about your post set. If you don't know very much about your post set, sort of the only anti-chains you can easily write down are to take everything on a particular rank. So if you're in your post set, like you often want to know uh, about like what kind of large anti-chains exist. And wouldn't it be nice if the large anti-chains were easy to produce. So if I want to know how big an anti-chain is, uh, I can always get a nice lower bound. If I just take one of my ranks, then I'd have an anti-chain at least that big. And I wish that that just was the right answer, that was the biggest anti-chain. And so if that's the case, then we define uh, this notion of a Sperner poset. Posets where the obvious anti-chains are the biggest ones you can get. Well, we can generalize this also. Uh, if we think about anti-chain, an anti-chain, it's a set that doesn't have any two element chain inside it. And so from that perspective, we can think of something more general. Maybe instead of wanting to avoid two element chains, I want to avoid three element chains or four element chains. Then I get this notion of being I Sperner. And usually that just shows up in this sort of uh, combined characterization, uh, the strong Sperner property or your Sperner for all i. Okay, so this is an i Sperner post set for all i. And if we just combine all the nice properties that we've talked about so far, so you have a post set that is rank symmetric and rank unimodal and has strong Sperner properties, then we call this PEC. Okay, so this up here has all these properties. This is a PEC post set. And these are just the best post sets. If I take sort of, uh, if I look randomly in the space of all post sets, like very few post sets have this property. But if you look at post sets that arise naturally, say like in an algebraic context, a lot of them will be PEC. And so 
this is a peck poset and uh, it's a Boolean lattice. And so more generally, all the Boolean lattices are peck posets. And this is sort of what Sperner did to get his name on this concept. Okay, so we'd like to find more peck posets, but it's sort of hard to tell if someone hands you a poset whether it has this property. You can check reasonably easily things like rank symmetry and rank unimodality. But if you want to understand about the Sperner properties, you sort of have to look uh, like very systematically through everything. It doesn't seem great. But Stanley gave an alternate characterization of uh, what it is to be a peck poset. So he says, like, look, if I have my poset, my poset's going to be shaped kind of like this. He says, look at every pair of symmetric ranks. So here I'm looking at the eighth rank from the bottom and the eighth rank from the top. And he wants to say, uh, let's find disjoint saturated chains from every element on here all the way up to the matching rank. So I want to find these disjoint saturated chains between these pairs of ranks. I want to do this for all pairs of ranks. So this is sort of a nice way to witness that you have a peck poset. If you want to show me to me that the post that you have is a peck posa, if you can just exhibit all these uh, lists of disjoint saturated chains, then it's easy for me to check that you have in fact verified that you've got a peck posa. But if you don't already know these chains, like producing them is not an obvious thing. It's not clear how you should come up with them. And so there's a third characterization of what it is to be a peck posa that is sort of more complicated and less concrete, but in many cases is easier to work with. And so we're going to use some linear algebra. So we're going to take a, a vector space, a vector space with basis given by elements of the poset. So elements of this vector space are linear combinations, formal linear combinations of poset elements. And we'll sort of grade it according to like which rank of the poset things live in. And so Stanley says what we should try to find are some linear maps that take you uh, one rank up in your poset. And again, we're going to look at these pairs of symmetric ranks. And we're going to take this, uh, this raising operator that takes you one rank up in your poset and we'll compose it with itself till we get from the ith rank from the bottom to the ith rank to the top. And Stanley says, what we need to check is that these compositions are all invertible. I can pick anything from the bottom and move to the matching thing to the top. And if it's always invertible, then I'll be happy as long as I check this one other condition, which is that when I move from one rank to the next, if I look at what happens to this element of the post it's going to go to some linear combination of things in the rank above. And the second condition says, I should only actually get a linear combination of things from the rank above that actually cover the element I started with. It could just be uh, any linear combination of things on that rank, but I want ones that cover the element I started with. Okay, so this is what we call uh, an order raising operator. So it's a raising operator because it takes you one rank up in your post set, but it's an order raising operator because you have this condition that uh, it respects the order relations in your post set. So if we can produce uh, these maps and verify these two properties, then we get to win. Okay, it's a little, uh, not the most obvious condition. I'll give you just a little hint about how you connect this to the other characterizations. The idea is if you look at this composition and you know this composition is invertible, well, think about writing it as a matrix. If it's invertible, then the determinant is not zero. The determinant is some polynomial. It's got a bunch of terms. And if it's not zero, then one of those terms is not zero. So just pick your favorite non-zero term out of that determinant in some way. And uh, just think about what that's telling you about the post set. Basically, if you forget all the numbers involved and just think about which post set elements show up uh, in that one term of the determinant, it's telling you how to write down these disjoint saturated chains. And here, that's enough of a hint that you can sort of extract the necessary linear algebra. There's nothing uh, 
really deep. It's just sort of uh, unwinding all the definitions. OK, so we want to be able to produce these things. So let's uh, see how we can do this uh, on some post-its that come out of the symmetric group. So let's remind you some things about the symmetric group. So symmetric group is the group of all the permutations of the numbers 1 through n. And every permutation you can get as a sequence of uh, simple transpositions. You can just successively swap adjacent letters uh, until you get whatever permutation you wanted to get, these SIs. OK, so this is essentially saying that the symmetric group is a special case of uh, what we call Cox order groups. So Cox order group is going to be any group that's generated by some involutions where the only other relations you have are that these products, sigma i, sigma j, uh, have some fixed finite orders that you get to compose. You get to pick what order these are, and then, then that's it. And so this is an example of a Cox order group. And so everything I'm saying today uh, will be just for the symmetric group, but a lot of it really uh, is also true for other Cox order groups. OK, so for any Cox order group, in particular in the symmetric group, we have a notion of the length, the length of a permutation. So I know that I can write my permutation as some sequence, as some product of these generators. And uh, the length is going to be the smallest length of such a uh, expression. Okay. So in terms of permutations, this is just the number of inversions in the permutation. And finally, I need this notion of a reflection in a Cox order group. A reflection is going to be any element of the group that's conjugate to one of the generators. So in, in permutation land, maybe you want to call this a transposition. So these generators SI let you swip, switch to adjacent things and uh, more general reflections will let you switch any two elements of your permutation. Okay, so with these notions, uh, we can build some partial orders. The first is a right weak order. It says if I take uh, a permutation and I apply the simple transposition SI on the right, well, either the length of that permutation will go up by one or it will go down by one. And if it goes up by one, then I have this cover relation. So that's uh, some way of ordering all of these permutations. I could just as well do the same thing uh, acting by my simple transpositions on the left. And I get a different post set, but it's, it's isomorphic, sort of obviously. So I get this left weak order. And then there's something else that people don't talk about as much, but that I, I find that I care about nowadays, uh, which is this two-sided weak order, where you let yourself multiply either on the right or the left. You just throw in all of the cover relations from both of these other things, and you get something. And then with even more relations, there's the strong order, where you let yourself act by any transposition. OK, so here, it doesn't matter whether I put the t on the right or the left, because multiplying by t on the right is the same as multiplying on the left by some other reflection. So there's only sort of one flavor of strong order. OK, so all of these posets have the same ranks. The ranks are just given by the lengths of the permutations or the number of inversions. And it's clear they're rank symmetric. It's uh, a bit less clear that they're rank unimodal. And it's very much unclear what the Sperner properties are here. It's not at all clear uh, how you would get anti-chains in these posets. But you might hope. Uh, I mean, symmetric group is a very nice group. And these are sort of natural orders you can put on it. You might hope that nice things would happen. You might sort of hope that you could have peck posets here. And for a long time, uh, we've known uh, a little bit of this. but but a lot of it's more recent. So here's uh, some pictures of these various orders in the special case of S3. So S3 have six permutations. And the red and the blue edges show you the right weak order. So going up in the right weak order, we're swapping adjacent letters of these words. That's the outer hexagon here. And the blue and the purple edges show you the left weak order, where we are allowed to swap uh, adjacent, not adjacent, we're allowed to swap consecutive numbers. So like from here to here, I'm swapping uh, the numbers two and three. 
Whereas from here to here, I'm swapping the uh, second and third position things. And so if I throw in all of these edges, then I get by definition the two-sided weak order. And because this example is unfortunately kind of small, uh, this is the same as the strong order in this case. But in general, the strong order will have more uh, relations than the two-sided weak order, maybe something in between. OK, so back in 1980, Stanley was able to show that strong order on the symmetric group was a peck poset. And the proof is pretty short, um, even if it's not super explicit about anything. So the proof goes like this. So let me take my symmetric group and build a vector space with basis given by permutations. So I have the uh, vector space of formal linear combinations of permutations, and it's graded by the length of my permutations. And then you just notice that uh, if you look at the cohomology ring of this object called the flag variety, it looks exactly the same. So this cohomology ring also has a basis labeled by permutations, and uh, it's also graded. And the grading is just by the length of the permutations. So as graded vector spaces, they're the same thing. And then you get to know some stuff. So there is an operation you can do inside this cohomology ring. You call multiplying by, by some hyperplane class. And it's fairly straightforward geometry to see that that's an order raising operator. And so then Stanley says, all you need to do then, once you've got this order raising operator, you need to check these uh, sort of central compositions of this operator. I need to check that they're always invertible. And then you're just really happy because a lot of really smart uh, geometers had been thinking about this problem exactly uh, for a long time and in more generality. And, and it's true. And it, it's called the hard left shut theorem. So you just get to cite that and then you win. Okay, so the hard left shut theorem is in fact hard, but other people have done it for you. So you don't have to do that. Okay, so this somehow uh, isn't the very combinatorial proof, all the you know, explicit combinatorics is hidden somewhere, but it, it is a very slick, powerful proof. And it actually doesn't just work for the symmetric group. You can plunk in basically any, uh, any finite coxeter group up here, and then there'll be some sort of corresponding uh, geometric object to plug in here, and then the rest of the proof is just the same. You don't have to do anything else. You just, you just get everything. So that tells you like, what you wanted to know about the strong order, but it, it's not clear what's going on with the weak orders. So it's clear they have the same ranks. So since the strong order is rank symmetric and rank unimodal, the weak order is also rank symmetric and rank unimodal, but it's not obvious what's happening with the antichains. When I go from strong order to weak order, I'm losing a lot of my relations. And so uh, the ranks didn't change, but the anti-chains in principle should have gotten a lot bigger. I've gotten presumably larger anti-chains, but I could wonder if maybe I didn't actually get larger anti-chains. And presumably people were thinking about this uh, in the late seventies, but the first place I know anyone speculating in print is this 1984 paper of Jorner. Uh, he's just sort of wondering uh, whether the weak order on these Coxeter groups is also still a peck post set. But it's not clear how to do this. Um, you could try to do sort of the same proof. Uh, but the problem is that this operator you had, this order raising operator, it was an order raising operator for strong order, but it's not an order raising operator for weak order. It doesn't respect those order relations. So it's not clear how to replace anything here. And so nothing really happened uh, for like, three and a half decades uh, until finally Stanley uh, had another idea. And essentially he just guessed uh, a different raising operator. So here's Stanley's guess of an operator. Uh, and you'll see I've actually, I've written it as an order lowering operator instead of a raising operator, but that's not really a problem. Like if that bothers you, you can just turn the whole post set upside down. The post set is self dual. So it doesn't matter which way I've done things. So he just has this guess. Uh, I'm supposed to take a permutation. And I'm supposed to send it to some linear combination of 
uh, permutation sitting below it. And he says, send it to a linear combination of all the, all the permutations sitting below it. So we're using uh, the left weak order here. It doesn't really matter whether I think about left weak order or right weak order, because they're isomorphic. Right? I can do either one of them, and then I'll be happy. So let me think of all the things sitting below w in left weak order, and I'll take their linear combination. And I'll use some coefficients. And the coefficients Stanley guesses I should use are just the subscripts off the simple transpositions that I used to move myself down in that order. Okay, it's not at all clear why uh, this is the operator you should think about. Uh, this is why Stanley didn't know what to do for 35 years. Uh, but then he guessed this. And once you've guessed this, you can go do some computations. So I have this order lowering operator. And by Stanley's 1980 theorem, all you need to know then is that certain compositions of this operator with itself uh, will have a non-vanishing determinant that they'll be invertible. And so he could do some computations and they, they were invertible in those examples, but more compellingly, uh, it looked like the determinant always had a really attractive product formula. Okay, and so the important thing about that is if you look at this nice formula, uh, it's obviously not zero. It's a product of a bunch of terms and none of the terms is zero. And so as long as this is not zero, then that tells me that all these compositions have to be invertible. And then by Stanley's theorem from 1980, uh, then you know that your weak order is still a peck poset. Okay, so this is the theorem that uh, we're gonna prove. So about a week before we uh, posted our, our paper to the archive, uh, Two uh, grad students at MIT, Christian Gates and Yibo Gao, uh, came up with their own proof. So they don't exactly prove Stanley's determinant conjecture, but they prove sort of the important part of it. Uh, what they're able to prove is that it's invertible. And the fact that it's invertible is enough to get you that the weak order is PEC. So their proof goes like this. Their proof, uh, it's sort of a very standard trick, but it's a hard trick to pull off in practice. What they do is they say, well, Stanley gave us this uh, operator phi, this order lowering operator, and we're just gonna be clever and invent uh, another operator that goes up in degree. So phi took you down one rank and psi is gonna take you up one rank. And we're gonna come up with a third operator that doesn't change your rank at all. And we're gonna do this in such a way that if you look at these three operators, they're going to form a representation of the Lie algebra SL2. And then once you've done that, uh, then you just get out like your favorite textbook on representation theory. And it just tells you immediately that uh, these uh, compositions of operators have to always be invertible. So the hard thing here is first of all, how do you guess what this operator should be, uh, especially this, this raising operator. There's no real uh, strategy for how to do that in a good way. You just have to be clever and guess. And then once you've guessed correctly, you still have to check that you really do have a representation of this Lie algebra. And like, that's also fairly hard. But then the final thing, you just sort of win for free. Okay. So we're going to give a, a different proof, although it's sort of a fairly similar proof. Again, we're going to build a representation of SL2. Um, but what's different is that we're going to use some combinatorics out of uh, the, the combinatorics of the flag variety that we mentioned before. And uh, that's going to let us understand Stanley's operator uh, as a differential operator. And as a differential operator, we're going to be able to then sort of change basis into uh, a different setting where it's easier to, um, easier to compute. So we'll be able to actually extract uh, Stanley's determinant. Okay, so let me talk more about the flag variety. So as a set, the set, the elements of the flag variety are uh, these flags of nested vector subspaces. So I look in CN, I'm looking for a line in CN contained in a plane, contained in a three space, all the way up. 
So if I want to write down like one particular flag, so I start with a zero dimensional vector space. I know what that looks like. And then I want to pick a line containing it. And like, why not just pick the span of the first standard basis vector? And then I want to pick a plane that contains that. So why not just pick the span of the first two standard basis vectors? And then maybe I'll pick a three space, pick sort of the obvious three space for them to live in. And then they have to live in all of C4. So this is one element of my complete flag variety. Okay, so at the moment, it's just a set. It's a set of all these flags of nested subspaces, but we can give it some geometry. So the point is, if I look at GLN acting well, like on C4 here, so GL4 acting on C4, it doesn't just like move the elements of C4 around, it actually moves the flags around. If I have a flag and I apply uh, an element of GLN, I get a different flag. And it moves around in a transitive way. So by the orbit stabilizer theorem, essentially, uh, that tells me that I can identify my flag variety with this group GLN quotient by the stabilizer of my favorite flag. And my favorite flag is probably just this flag here. Okay. So then I want to think a little bit about which elements of GLN stabilize this particular flag I wrote down. And it's not so hard to convince yourself that that's exactly the upper triangular matrices. So I can identify the flag variety with this quotient of the general linear group by upper triangular matrices. And, and now it has geometry because GLN has geometry. It sort of lives in uh, an n squared dimensional space. And this is also inside there. And sort of everything has topology, has geometry. And so I end up with this thing. And it's uh, just sort of a nice geometric object to smooth uh, projective variety. OK, so let's see a little bit more common uh, torques coming out of linear algebra here. So one thing we do in like uh, first semester of linear algebra class is you like hand your students a square matrix, and they start doing row operations on it. And the hope is that you get this LU decomposition of your matrix. So you can write it as a lower triangular matrix times an upper triangular matrix. And if I hand you like a random uh, square matrix, probably that works out. But of course, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes you get stuck by a permutation matrix in the middle. And so from my perspective, what this is doing for you is it's breaking up the general linear group into pieces according to which permutation matrix you got stuck on. There's this big piece where W is the identity matrix and you actually have an LU decomposition. And then there's these various like gradually smaller pieces of the general linear group where you have to do more and more uh, row swaps in order to get things decomposed. So if I have this decomposition of the general linear group and my flag variety was a quotient of the general linear group, then uh, I can just sort of carry this decomposition over to that. And I'll get uh, this decomposition of the flag variety into some cells, I'll call these Schubert cells, and I can take their closures. And their closures are some like very nice algebraic varieties, these Schubert varieties. And for our purposes, the important thing is they, they give you a cell decomposition of the space, which means a lot of, a lot of nice things. But in particular, uh, it means the following. So it means that for every one of these Schubert varieties sitting inside the space, my Schubert varieties are labeled by permutations. For each one, I get some cohomology class. And not only do I get a cohomology class for each one, but they actually make a basis. So every element of the cohomology, I can write it in terms of these Schubert varieties. Okay, so then another nice thing, sort of separately, uh, is this nice theorem of Borel, says whatever this cohomology thing is, in this case, I can write it down uh, very explicitly as a quotient of a polynomial ring. I just want to take polynomials in n variables, and I'm going to quotient by all the polynomials <clears throat> that are symmetric. So this is, <coughs> this is polynomials that are symmetric under uh, permuting the variables. 
So this means that for every Schubert variety, there's a corresponding uh, equivalence class of polynomials. But it, it's a pain to work with equivalence classes, right? And cosets are, are sort of hard to work with. It would be nicer if uh, you actually had a nice choice of coset representative instead of working with this equivalence class of polynomials, like actually pick a coset representative that like was a good choice somehow. And like in general, there shouldn't be a good way to choose coset representatives. You can just sort of choose whatever you want. Yet you know, somehow in this case, there is a best way to choose coset representatives and uh, Lascou and Schutz and Berger uh, sort of guessed what the right answer was. And later we understood why it was the right answer. Uh, so they sort of tell you how to pick out of each one of these cosets a particular element that is the best element and that should be the representative for that. And so these are called Schubert polynomials. And so there's one Schubert polynomial for every permutation and they're associated to the geometry that Schubert varieties in some way. So uh, the combinatorics of these Schubert polynomials is very beautiful and it's going to be sort of what makes uh, everything go for the rest of my talk. So I'm going to tell you a couple of ways of thinking about Schubert polynomials. They have a lot of really nice combinatorics. So we're going to define them, first of all, uh, by recursion down the right weak order. So I'm going to start at the top of weak order. At the top of weak order, I have my longest permutation, w naught, the one that just writes everything backwards. And we'll just declare that the Schubert polynomial for that is going to be one monomial. It's going to be the sort of like staircase monomial where the exponents go down as the uh, variable indices go up. So for example, in S3, uh, my longest element is 3, 2, 1, and the corresponding Schubert polynomial is the side that's going to be x1 squared x2. And then I'm going to recurse down right weak order, and the rest of my Schubert polynomials are going to be determined by applying these operators, these divided difference operators. So from here to here, I swap the first two letters of my word. So this is an S1, and this is an S2, and this is an S1. This must be S2, S1, S2. So to get from here to here, I used S1. So I'm going to apply the operator N1 uh, to my Schubert polynomial. And so this means I take my polynomial and I subtract off what I get from that polynomial swapping the x1s and x2s. So I get x1, x2 squared, swapping x1 and x2, and I divide by x1 minus x2. And if I did things correctly, hopefully I'm now going to get x1, x2, uh, which is the thing that I wrote here. Okay, and, and so if we just continue recursing down, uh, I should get these six polynomials that I wrote here. Okay, so there's like various things to check here. It's not entirely clear this is a, a good definition, but uh, everything works out. Everything is really nice. Uh, there's some other things that you can't see from this definition. Uh, if you compute a bunch of these Schubert polynomials, what you notice is that all of the coefficients are positive integers. So in this case, these six things, all the coefficients are actually positive one. Uh, but if I look in a larger symmetric group, I'll get other numbers, but there won't be any minus signs. And that's very much not obvious from this recursive definition because I'm subtracting all sorts of stuff and I'm dividing stuff and I should kind of get a mess. But in fact, I don't. I get uh, positive integer coefficients. So there's a combinatorial explanation of this, which is they're actually generating functions for some nice combinatorial objects. And the objects I want to tell you about are some sort of tilings. So I'm going to take an n by n grid, and I want to tile it using these four kinds of tiles. And my tiling has to satisfy some various conditions, and they're kind of technical. So uh, let's just kind of uh, wave past them, and I'll show you an example of like what, what kinds of tilings I'm allowed to count. They're going to be things that look like this. So the important thing is like all the interesting stuff happens in this upper left half. And if I look along the left side, I have these four pipes coming out of the left side that then uh, proceed northeast and then vanish at the top of my grid. And if I look at sort of which pipe comes out in which order, 
and I write them like that, uh, that's a permutation. So for every pipe dream like this, I get a permutation associated. So I'm going to make a generating function for these pipe dreams. And so I need some sort of weight to associate to them. And the weight is going to just keep track of where these plus tiles show up. So here are my plus tiles showed up in the first two rows. And so I'm going to record an x1, x2 for this, for this pipe dream. Okay. So here's this beautiful theorem that manifests the monomial positivity of, of Schubert polynomials. It says that Schubert polynomials are exactly uh, generating functions for the pipe dreams that trace out the permutation W, where you count them according to uh, this weight, which rows of the pluses show up in. So for example, if I want to know the Schubert polynomial 2143, I write down all the possible pipe dreams uh, where the pipes trace out 2143, and then I look at the weights that they give me, and I get these three terms here. Okay. So sort of a basic combinatorial question you might have, I mean, this is a bit of an aside, but one thing you might wonder is like, how did I know I'm supposed to have three pipe dreams? If you just like hand me a permutation like this, how, how could I possibly have known that like there should have been three things I was gonna write down? Can I know when I've gotten them all? And there's a really weird formula for this, uh, due to Ian McDonald. So let me tell you this, this formula for counting pipe dreams of a given permutation. So I need first this concept of, of reduced words. So if I have a permutation of length k, that means I can write my permutation w as a product of k simple transpositions, maybe in various ways, but pick, pick some way of doing that. And they'll just write down the subscripts. And that sequence of subscripts was called a reduced word. So here's, here's McDonald's formula for the number of pipe dreams. Well, he says the number of pipe dreams, that's what I get in my Schubert polynomial if I just set all the x variables equal to one. And here's how I count them. Uh, it's one over k factorial times the sum over all reduced words for that particular permutation. And now is the part where it gets really weird. Uh, now I'm going to take these subscripts of the involutions that I used, and I'm going to treat them like integers, and I'm going to multiply them all together and add them up. Okay, this is weird because basically these a1 through ak, they're basically just like index things. They're, they don't really mean much, uh, but uh, somehow I like just multiply them and add them up, and like I get the right answer. It's a very weird sort of thing to do. Um, I'm not sure exactly how McDonald thought about this originally. His proof is sort of baffling. It's kind of manipulatorics. Uh, he just sort of does some stuff and then, then it's there. Um, there was a more conceptual proof a few years later uh, by Fomin and Stanley. They develop uh, sort of a theory of milk oxider algebras. And they're able to extract this. For a long time, like people, people wanted something better. So like this, this statement sort of feels very combinatorial. Like over here, I'm counting pipe dreams. That's a very, like very counting some combinatorial objects. And k factorial, that's like very much combinatorics land. And then this is some sort of counting thing too. So I can imagine if I just like move the k factorial to the side, I should like be able to find some kind of bijective proof of this. And people for a long time wanted the bijective proof, and that was very uh, recently resolved by Sarah Billy and Axel Holroyd and, and Ben Young. Uh, and, but the proof is hard. So this is like a 30 something page bijection. Like all this paper does is establish this bijectively and it takes them quite a bit of effort. So uh, the stuff we're going to do is going to go with some new proof of this. And it's not, maybe I'm not sure the most insightful proof, but it's a very short proof. It's a very memorable proof. Like I can't remember any of these three proofs, but mine is uh, memorable at least. Okay. So we'll do that and we'll prove also the Stanley conjecture. And so the thing that makes everything go is uh, to think about this differential operator. So this differential operator, Nabla, just 
take all the partial derivatives of your polynomial and add them all together. Something you might think about in calculus class. So you can plug any polynomial you want into this operator and like, why not Schubert polynomials? Uh, you could do that. And if you do, you discover something really nice happens. So Nabla clearly takes the degree of your polynomial down by one. The differential operators take things down in degree. Um, so I'm going to get, I plug in the Schubert polynomial for W and I'm going to get some Schubert polynomials of rank one smaller, but it's not just any Schubert polynomials of rank one smaller. It's exactly the ones that are below W in left weak order. And not only that, but they show up with these coefficients and the coefficients are exactly the subscripts on the simple transposition that you used to move down. Okay, and so I don't know if you remember, but this is exactly the operator that Stanley wrote down. It just comes out in this way. And this, this is not hard to prove. Uh, it's essentially like a homework exercise, uh, provided you've thought to do this weird thing of applying this differential operator to a Schubert polynomial. Nothing really complicated going on. But this gives us a really short proof of this McDonald identity for counting pipe dreams. Uh, so here, here it goes. So let's take a, take a monomial of degree k. What happens if I take a monomial of degree k and apply nabla k times? Well, every time I apply nabla, the degree goes down by one. So if I apply it k times, I'm going to get a constant. I'm going to get a k factorial for each monomial. So I'm going to get k factorial times the number of pipe dreams. OK, but by that little proposition on the previous slide, when I apply nabla, what I get is a linear combination of the things below me and left weak order, weighted by which transposition I use to move down. So if I apply it k times, that's just chasing out all ways of getting from w down to the identity in left weak order. And as I go down, I keep track of exactly which uh, transpositions I used. So that's exactly just looking at all the reduced words and multiplying all the numbers that showed up along the way. It's all come out right there. So there's the shortest proof of that strange little theorem. OK, but we also use this to uh, prove Stanley's determinant conjecture. And so the proof here is also not very hard. So essentially, uh, what we need to do, we need to think about the space of polynomials uh, spanned by monomials that fit under a staircase. So monomials where the variables can have uh, various exponents and the exponents have to go down as the indices on the variables increase. So one of these monomials is that uh, Schubert polynomial for the long element w naught that we talked about, and the rest of them are things that divide that. That's the space of polynomials I want to talk about, just as a vector space. So it turns out that all the Schubert polynomials for the symmetric group live in this space. They live in this the span of these monomials, and they're actually a basis for it. So this vector space w has two bases. There's this one basis of monomials, like the obvious basis. And there's this less obvious basis of Schubert polynomials that is, in fact, the better basis. So we have these two bases. And so I was supposed to uh, compute what happens when I compose this map phi a lot. But we said that's the same as just computing the compositions of this differential operator nabla. And I'm supposed to do that in the Schubert basis. But moving between this Schubert basis and the monomial basis, uh, the, the matrix that does that change of basis for you, it's a uni so It doesn't mess with determinants at all. So instead of computing the, the determinant in my Schubert basis, like I was supposed to, I can compute it in the monomial basis, and I haven't lost anything. Okay, and so this is like the advantage we have over Gates and Gao is because they don't have things in terms of this differential operator. They're stuck in the Schubert basis all the time. And so things become very technical and very hard to work with. 
but we can move uh, directly to the monomial side and things get much cleaner. And then we can bring in representation theory of SL2. And the representation theory of SL2 is like very well understood. Uh, in each dimension, there's exactly one irreducible representation. And you can think of this irreducible representation as just given by the space of polynomials of degree at most k. Right, the polynomials of degree at most k, that's a k plus one dimensional space. And uh, you can define it to be uh, the right thing. So the SL2 uh, is generated by three elements. There's going to be one element that makes the degree of things go down by one. There's going to be one element that keeps the degree of things the same. And there's going to be one element that makes the degree of things go up by one. Okay, so this is just sort of a standard way of writing down this, these particular irreducible representations. But the thing to notice is like, what is F doing? Uh, like sort of every calculus student would recognize what F is doing. Uh, it's just, just taking the derivative of a polynomial. That's all that's happening there. So now this space W, the span of these sort of uh, monomials that fit under a staircase, that means the first variable is allowed to have degree at most n minus one, and the second variable is allowed to have degree at most n minus two, and so on. So you can identify W with this like tensor product of these uh, WKs that we had before, and that gives it uh, the structure of an SL2 representation. And now like F, F just acted by taking the derivative. And uh, if you know how things are supposed to act then on tensor products, that means that F is gonna act on this tensor product, act on W, it's gonna act by taking all the partial derivatives and then adding them all together. So F just by definition acts like NABLA, this thing we wrote down before. And so now I was supposed to compute like the determinant of powers of NABLA, but that just means I'm computing the determinant of powers of F. And now this is just like a very standard uh, representation theory calculation. I'm computing the determinant of powers of F uh, for these like very uh, explicit representations, like very explicitly out in coordinates. And you just kind of do it and you write it down and you get, you get the thing that Stanley said you were gonna get. And you can even sort of see where some of the structure comes in. Like you have this thing here that looks uh, essentially like uh, a partial factorial where you have this thing and it's getting bigger each time. Well, that just comes from what happens when you take derivatives repeatedly. If I take a, a polynomial and I take the derivative, the, you know, the exponent comes down to a coefficient out front and I do it again and then exponent's one smaller and that comes down out front. And I get this kind of uh, factorial like thing coming out. So it's exactly coming out of this operator in that way. OK, so uh, I have a couple of minutes. So let me just tell you briefly like what is still unclear about this business. So we uh, know for the strong order on any finite coxeter group that it'll be a peck poset. But the argument I just gave uh, only talks about weak order on the symmetric group. And it's not clear how you should extend that to anything else. In, anyway. So Gates and Gao have a conjecture that in fact, all the finite coxeter groups, the weak order will be a peck poset. I don't think I actually personally have any real sense of whether or not that's true. Um, I don't have any intuition for it. Uh, so like one way you could try to understand this is like we're missing geometry. Like in the strong order case, uh, we had sort of a uniform proof of peckness uh, sort of for geometry reasons. And it's not at all clear what the geometry of this NABLA operator is supposed to be. I don't know what's going on here. You think, well, one thing you can think about this, like nil, the nil coxeter algebra, like the things we've proven are sort of of the flavor of saying this nil coxeter algebra sort of acts like it satisfies a uh, Poincaré duality. And it sort of acts like it satisfies the hard left shit theorem. But that doesn't exactly make sense because those are things you're supposed to say about cohomology rings. And the nil coxeter algebra is definitely not a cohomology ring. So I'm not really sure uh, what, what I'm supposed to say about this. And then there's sort of another vague thing that I don't really know to do with. Um, 
but we have this operator in Nabla and for no particular reason, we put Schubert polynomials into it and it sort of did everything we wanted for us. And I just wonder like what other polynomials you could possibly put in Nabla and like learn cool stuff from. Uh, I've tried some things and uh, I haven't learned cool stuff so much from the other ones, but it, it's not clear why this is specifically a thing for Schubert polynomials, why this tells us uh, stuff about that. Okay, so I will stop here and leave you with a nice picture of some uh, of some various post set structures on S three. Thank you, Oliver, for the nice talk. That's very beautiful as well. Um, so let's see if there's any question from the audience. Uh, <clears throat> I, I've got a question. Uh, in uh, some of these contexts in, in post sets, like, such as the Boolean lattice, you, you have a theorem about the largest antichain, but you also can get a theorem about the number of antichains. Like in the Boolean lattice, the number mm -hmm. of antichains is roughly two to the power of the size of the largest one, where roughly is on the log scale. Could you hope for that kind of thing more generally in these post sets? That's a good question. Um, I don't think I have any idea. Yeah, I don't know anything about the number of antichains in the symmetric group. But that, that seems like a thing you would want to know. I agree. Okay. Oliver, in the, um, is there any sort of like way you can interpret um, taking derivatives as uh, in a combinatorial way, like we do with in species, we think of, you know, the differential operator does this rooting operation and Schubert polynomials are generating functions. So are we maybe, is there any way we're like this, we're doing anything to pipe dreams? Maybe. I don't know. That would be really cool if you could explain it uh, as an action on the pipe dreams. Do you have do you have any other ideas about how like what it should mean on the pipe dreams? No, I I literally yeah. just learned about pipe dreams in your talk. So okay, uh, I also have but no I, idea. I, but I'd be I would be uh, I'd be interested in like check in in you know looking into that. It'd be cool. Yeah, you probably know more about species than I do. So it'd be something uh, like marking a crossing. Something what? Something like marking a crossing in the pipe dream. Yeah. Counting pipe dreams with a marked crossing. Well, I guess let's, let's in that sense, yeah. I guess in that sense, yeah, it's not that um, uh, illuminating if that's all it's doing. Well, it could be. I mean, I would like some sort of conceptual explanation for the fact that Nabla acts so nicely on Schubert polynomials. Whereas it doesn't act as nicely on like other polynomials that show up in algebraic combinatorics. And maybe you could explain that in terms of the combinatorics of pipe dreams. Yeah, I guess one thing though is that they're um, I guess like pipe dreams are yeah, it's like we're working with ordinary ordinary generating functions. And typically when you were talking about rooting, we're talking about like uh, classes that are counted with exponential generating functions. You can root either way. There, there might be something there though. And that would be really nice if we had some explanation of what this, uh, what this sort of uh, characterization of Nabla comes down to. Right? At the moment, it's just like a calculation. You just do it and then you win. Um, other questions? Okay, hearing that. So um, let's uh, thank Oliver again um, for the nice talk.
the rat house. Thank you. That was very, that was a lot of fun. I'm glad. <clears throat> Thanks for the talk, Oliver. Uh, thank you. Jane, do you want to stop the recording if we're just chatting? Oh, right, right, right. I keep forgetting that. I'm sorry. <laughs>